Uh, good morning. We're here on the margins of the National Security College Conference on Strengthening uh, Australia, Japan, US uh, Strategic Cooperation. And we're lucky to be joined uh, by uh, Dhruva Jaishanka, from, who's a fellow with the uh, uh, Brookings India, um, certainly one of the leading uh, think tanks in India uh, who work on, on foreign policy. So good morning, Dhruva. Morning. Um, Dhruva, I'm going to start with uh, a big question, so you, uh, you can take it however, um, take it wherever you would like. Uh, obviously, over the last uh, 12 months or, or, or a couple of years, there's been a lot of developments in the Indian Ocean region. Uh, China has been very active with the, its One Belt, One Road initiative and its relationship with Pakistan. Um, more recently, we've seen a lot of developments in the United States, of course, and a lot of uncertainties um, coming from that. Um, uh, gazing into your crystal ball, how do you see uh, the China-US relationship playing out in the Indian Ocean over the next several years and how will that affect India? Where, where will India sit with that? Yeah, I, I, we're in for a very uh, uncertain but very interesting time, uh, not, all, not necessarily in a positive way. Um, the Indian Ocean, as, as you well know, uh, is uh, perhaps, I mean, it's, it's one of the most important bodies of water. I mean, just if you look at the, um, as, as, a, uh, as a conduit for international commerce, um, in terms of the population that lives around in, in the Indian Ocean littoral, um, and also as a, a source of resources, natural resources. And so the Indian Ocean is, is extremely important for all these reasons. Um, and yet the security architecture to, to sort of secure and govern the Indian Ocean is, is rather weak, particularly relative to the Atlantic and Pacific oceans. And so you have this sort of mismatch here again between the importance of the Indian Ocean as a body of water, um, but a lack of, uh, of, of, of the necessary infrastructure uh, and, and relationships to, to, to secure uh, the Indian Ocean. Um, and so I think we're going to see this tension play out more and more. Um, of course, the United States has long been a resident power in the Indian Ocean. In Diego Garcia, there's a, there's a significant presence in Bahrain. Um, but uh, we're, we're now seeing, of course, a growing uh, presence of the Chinese PLA Navy uh, in the Indian Ocean. Um, and uh, this has been accompanied, of course, as, as, as you mentioned, by uh, a large number of Chinese infrastructure projects in the Indian Ocean littoral, uh, Pakistan being one place, East Africa, I think, is, is extremely significant, uh, Djibouti, where they might, might be establishing their first uh, true naval base outside of China, um, and in Southeast Asia, uh, and South Asia, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, and other places. Uh, now, of course, th th so this environment, this is the sort of backdrop in which India, which is just trying to emerge from out of a rather continental mindset uh, towards a more sort of Indian Ocean uh, a maritime mindset, uh, is, is going to have to confront with, the, with the, uh, these changing dynamics. Um, and I think a, f a few things just have to be kept in mind, at least. Uh, there, there are no easy sort of answers as to how India or, or other countries in the, in the region can, can respond to this, Australia being one of the, the countries on the Indian Ocean littoral. Uh, but I think a few things to keep in mind. One, one is, um, I, I think, the weakness of the existing security order. Uh, I think is, is something that, that I think needs to be understood and appreciated. The second is that economics is now strategic. Um, I think there was a belief, particularly after the end of the Cold War, that, that uh, those, the, those kinds of relationships could, could function on parallel tracks, that, that you could have uh, a sort of economic interdependence at a, at a global level, uh, but uh, aside from strategic competition. But now increasingly those, the, the lines have become blurred, and I think one by one road, certainly from India's point of view, and India has perhaps been one of the most vocal uh, skeptics of One Belt, One Road. Um, ha it, it, this is certainly an issue, which is, which is now, India doesn't see this necessarily as an economic project, it sees it, uh, or a commercial project, it sees it as primarily a strategic project. Um, I, I think that that's a second consideration to, to take into place, uh, to take into account. Um, the third, and, and again from India's point of view, I think the, the, there's been a bit of a change in the disposition towards the U.S. presence. Uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, India was quite vocal about talking about the United States as an outside presence in the Indian Ocean. Uh, it was quite critical of Diego Garcia and, 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 and American presence there. Uh, but uh, this has changed, and now uh, Indian leaders talk quite publicly about the U.S. being a, a, a resident 
uh, power in the Indian Ocean and in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, so I think this is another uh, change that has taken place. But but the long, um, I think the long game, I think for all the actors involved, the United States, China, India, Australia, others, uh, will be how to make the Indian Ocean, uh, how to prevent the Indian Ocean from becoming the next South China Sea, from becoming the central locus of competition uh, for the world's great powers. Yeah. Um, just turning uh, to the United States and, uh, and uh, President Trump, uh, obviously over the last uh, decade or so, uh, India has been increasingly uh, tilting towards um, the United States. How do you see um, the, uh, the Trump administration affecting that? And do you see there being uh, risks of perhaps a precipitate uh, U.S. withdrawal from the region which could create a power vacuum and instability? Um, I, uh, I think India is, relatively speaking, not badly placed by a Trump administration. There are going to be some downsides. Uh, I think we're going to see some issues on immigration and bilateral economic relations that may um, uh, certainly complicate India-US bilateral relations. But that being said, I think on, on strategic matters, there may be more of a meeting of the minds between Washington and New Delhi uh, in, the, in the next few years. Um, I think India was actually quite welcoming of a few steps that have been taken just in the last week under Trump's presidency. Uh, one is the cancellation of TPP. I know it is not uh, particularly uh, uh, well received here in Australia, naturally. But for India, which was outside, this, this actually gave a little bit of respite. Um, uh, I think uh, a better relations between Washington and Moscow is another thing India would welcome. Um, and I think talk of a, l a larger uh, maritime presence in the Indo-Pacific by, by some of Trump's advisors is also something that would be welcomed. Um, now where are the, the, the downsides? I think the downsides are if this is, um, if we see from Washington a sort of belligerence, belligerent rhetoric that is not necessarily backed up. Uh, by uh, a will to, to, to see it through, that is actually a very dangerous combination, um, not just for India, but I think also for US allies in the region, uh, which is we, that could lead to a precipitation of, ten, or, or of greater tensions, uh, but without necessarily the, the United States providing the credibility of the will, even if it has the capabilities, uh, to, to n ensure uh, a stability in, in the Indo-Pacific. And I think that, that that is a very serious cause of concern in, in New Delhi. Yeah. And, and do you think that uh, Beijing e may potentially take advantage of uh, instability caused by, I suppose, unpredictability of the United States by advancing its presence in the Indian Ocean region further? I mean, I, I think the U.S. is the U.S. is a very important actor in the Indian Ocean, but not the only actor, obviously, and not not necessarily even the preeminent actor. Uh, there is a bit of a vacuum, uh, if you will, in, in the Indian Ocean. Uh, but I think you, 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 we, can, we get a sense of this just looking at the South China Sea, um, where even the Obama administration, uh, which had by then announced the pivot, but, but really wasn't able to enforce uh, uh, the, uh, uh, to, 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 to draw clear lines and, and enforce them on China's militarization of the South China Sea. Um, I think that, that we've already, we're in some ways well past that point where, where the US, you know, where, where, where uh, through fait accomplis and other, uh, China has been able to, to make advances um, and the US has been really uh, unable to, to, or unwilling to, 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 to stop it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I do think, I mean, it's not specific to the Trump administration. I, I do think that there is a larger issue of uh, not, not just US capabilities, which is one aspect of it, but US will to play a role. And, and, and these are legitimate, I think, for, for average uh, American voters, uh, you know, when, when they, many of them would not know, be able to identify the South China Sea in a map, and, and I think the national security elites in the U.S. and I think this is a common problem, not just this is not just an American problem, have done a very poor job communicating to a general public or explaining to a general public why some of these issues are really so important and, and so much uh, for, for for national security. Uh, the conference we're at today um, relates to um, strengthening cooperation between Australia, Japan, United States and other partners, uh, in including India. Um, Japan is, is showing uh, increasing interest in the Indian Ocean region. Um, do you think that Japan could play a positive role in helping to stabilise the Indian Ocean region and helping to build 
um, uh, security architecture there? Oh, absolutely. I think I think Japan is a, a, a real cri a, a critical player uh, in in this for uh, two reasons at least. Uh, one is in terms of infrastructure uh, building. I mean, I think we tend to under we, uh, a lot has been made of one belt, one road. But if you actually look at infrastructure on the ground uh, in in the Indian Ocean littoral, Japan has been a, has played an enormous role in, in East Africa. Uh, their their uh, potential projects or, 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 or uh, new projects in in Bangladesh, in, in Dawe, in in potentially in Sri Lanka. Um, and so uh, Iran, and so all, all over the Indian Ocean uh, region. So Japan is very competitive in, the, in that space, and, and perhaps is the only, in, at least in terms of these sort of mega infrastructure projects, is, is the only other country apart from China that's able to deliver. Um, the second is, um, I, I think, the sort of gradual remilitarization of Japan. I mean, in many of this is sort of the changes in national security, ref national security reforms that, that have uh, taken place in Japan, um, has positioned it rather well. If you look at, uh, for example, uh, all the trilateral <coughs> meetings that take place at a high, a senior level on a regular basis in the Asia, Asia Pacific. Japan is part of almost every one. Uh, China, Japan, South Korea, US, Japan, Australia, US, Japan, India, Japan, Australia, India. Uh, Japan is in some ways a nodal power uh, for this emerging security architecture. Um, and so I think both on the security side uh, under Prime Minister Abe, uh, but also, I mean, for, for much longer as, as, a, as, a, as a key com and a strategic, you know, a country that's able to direct its commercial energies in a, in a strategic way, uh, Japan does play an outsized role in, in the Indian Ocean and will be. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you very much for your, um, your thoughts today. Thank and uh, I look forward to further contributions at the conference. Thank, thank you very you. much.